there are youth ministers that I I just marvel at. And our last presenter today is one of them. David Skidmore has served as a youth minister at the North Boulevard Church of Christ uh, in Murfreesboro, Tennessee for, uh, well, I want to say a couple of decades. He's been in youth ministry for a quarter of a century. And yet David is such a Renaissance man. You will see a wall behind him. And if we took time, he would take you through uh, his signed Fred Rogers uh, autograph uh, or Star Wars toys or uh, amazing charcoals done by a member of his youth group. Uh, David leads a youth ministry of hundreds of students. In fact, let me just not guess. David, currently, how many students are you ministering to there at North Boulevard? Uh, best guess. Best guess, I don't know, 7th to 12th grade, there's... Um, about 350 names on the roll uh, currently in that, in that age group. But I don't have David on here because it's a big group. I have David on here because of his tenacity and willingness to always think creatively, creatively. There's a new word of saying that, creatively. Always thinking creatively about how to disciple. Discipling is at the root of their ministry. And I asked him just to come and talk about, you know, hey, it's still youth ministry even during COVID. Uh, David, can you start by just giving us 30 seconds on that crazy Wednesday night program that you did that became a, a, a viral sensation? Well, I don't know about that. Um, we just broadcast our, our Wednesday night service uh, and had quite a few folks from, from all over the, uh, the country kind of uh, chime in. And um, we interviewed some folks and got to visit with some folks. Jeff was a part of that, along with some other um, really neat uh, people across uh, across the world, actually. So uh, it was it was a lot of fun. It was our Wednesday night program, and like everybody else, we just tried to find a way to to uh, to put it live into the homes of our students where they could uh, engage. Cool. Well, David, um, I know you've you've always got a core that's kind of a foundation. So I'll throw you the softball. If you had that elevator speech for a youth minister to try and center them well, what would it be? The, the mic is yours. Okay. Okay. That's what we're going to do. First of all, I want to say this, uh, Zach, I'm going to uh, mail you one of these so you can wear this so that you and I don't get crossways. Um, we might get crossways if we don't. So there you go. Um, uh, I will say this. Hello to so many people. It's been so exciting to look on and see so many faces of people that I have not seen in a very long time. And I wish I could say hello to everybody individually. I'm honored to serve alongside all of you uh, sisters and brothers. And there are so many people here that are so very special to me. I am not a doctor. In fact, I have only been to the doctor once in 10 years. And that was uh, a, a, about a month ago, only to be told that I was probably suffering a panic attack and not having issues with my heart. So maybe I'm qualified to be on this call and to follow up these other uh, two presenters. Um, I do want to thank uh, Dudley and Dr. Horton. It was fabulous to hear what you all had to share. And so here's what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to try to end, end this with, um, I know we've had some heavy stuff. They had no choice but to end on a heavy note. So what I'm going to try to do is to kind of pick us back up off the ground. I want to frame my passion for ministry really quickly. I'm going to give you three or four practical tools, very practical, so that you at least walk away from here with something you can actually go and do and not just have to think about. And then I want to give you a metaphor of something I saw on the news that I think describes our calling in a better way, um, that, uh, in, in a better way than I've heard, uh, seen it described in a long time. I am going to share uh, my screen here, and I'm going to go very, very quickly. Um, so let's do this. And I think everybody can see that. Um, I am not able to see but like four or five people on my screen. So if there is an issue, uh, you might want to put it in the chat or Jeff, you may have to, you can stop me. But I'm going to go really quick because I want to get through a lot of ground here. Um, there's 52 weeks in a year. And so we have 52 Sundays, 52 um, Wednesdays. And out of the 365 days of the year, if they were to, if our students were to come to us every Sunday and every Wednesday, we would have them for 104 hours. So clearly the primary role of discipleship takes place in the home and it's not with us, but, but uh, we need to be faithful stewards of that 104 hours. That's four days that we get students out of the course of, uh, of an entire year. If they come every single week, this is obviously not counting trips and camps. And that's why those things are obviously important. Now, a student is going to spend 61,000 hours as a teenager from when the time they turn 13 through age 19. And so if you take those four days and those 104 hours and go throughout their students' lives, we're going to have them for 728 hours. 
one of these days I want to write a book that's just called 728 hours because um, I think we're, that, that's how, how many um, hours we're going to have our students in our care. And being in the Church of Christ, I'm sure I'll have a, a chapter called 728B, but I, only about maybe 30, 13 of us are going to understand that. Also, I'll move on. Uh, so 104 hours. How are we going to spend that 104 hours? We really need to be thinking about um, what do we want our students to know in the 104 hours we have? Because this picture describes what most of us feel when it comes to ministering to students. We tell somebody, hey, I need you to go and teach the seventh grade boys and girls class, or I need you to go and, and lead this group. And this is what a lot of our volunteers face, especially with uh, everything that's going on in the world right now, which I'm going to get to that more specifically. But I want to begin with a, with a question. Um, and all of our question marks kind of look like this right now, right? I want to give, uh, I want to start with a question. And I want to go into uh, the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John. Would you just follow along with me for just a second here? Mary stands outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look in the tomb. And she saw two angels in white where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said. And I don't know where they put him. At this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. I don't want to take liberties with scripture, but I just want us to, to uh, fall in for just a moment and take this verse and see our students. First of all, they're, they're crying. They're in pain. We'll get to that in just a minute. Then they've taken my Lord away. Uh, a lot of our students felt like, I don't know where they put him. And then she turns around and she sees Jesus who's standing right there, but she doesn't recognize that it's Jesus. In this one, two sentences, I, I see really all of our students, um, many of our students right now. And so it says that he asked her, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you put him and I'll get him. And then Jesus says to her, Mary, let's go back to the question first of all, why are you crying? And who is it you're looking for? Then Jesus calls her by name, and then she turns and she cries out to him, Rabbi, and she recognizes who he is. Jesus says, don't hold on to me, for I've not yet ascended to my uh, father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them that I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with this news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Okay, so I just want to go back to this sentence, and I want to drop everything else out. And what we see, I think, are the two fundamental questions um, that we need to ask all of our students. Why are you crying, and what is it, who is it that you're looking for? In other words, what is your greatest source of pain? And then we take this sentence out, we take everything else out except what she cries out, I have seen the Lord. Now, maybe you notice that uh, I've got these two questions, and I have this one exclamation, because the, the bottom line is where we want all of our students to get to. We want them to have an intimate, personal encounter with God. So I started with what I think are the two greatest questions. Now, those of you that have heard me teach, you, you may have heard me use this uh, analogy or illustration before, but I think it's so fundamental to our discussion today. Those are the two greatest questions, and then it leads to the greatest question, uh, greatest exclamation point. And I really see that my passion in ministry is to guide students from the question mark to the exclamation point. Does that mean they're not going to have any more questions? No. We're going to teach them to ask better questions. Are we going to be able to answer all of their questions? No. But we're going to lead them to the exclamation point. I love a friend of mine who really knows this Hebrew, and he says, you know, there's some debate on this, but he says that, that image right there on the screen really describes manna. Manna is a, a word that, you know, means what is it? You know, we've learned that when we were in elementary school. What is it? But he says it's like the, the, the Hebrew question mark and exclamation point put together. That's the best way to visualize what manna is. And he says that's kind of a good way. There's some people that may take issues with that grammatically, but, um, but, but I, I at least like the idea. And so all of us are dealing with students with great questions, and we're trying to move them into that exclamation point. Because as, as Dudley and as Dr. Horton said, this word describes all of our students. And as somebody pointed out to me, a mentor a long time ago, right there in the middle of the word anxious is, is, is me, like I. Everything, uh, when, when it comes about me, that's when the anxiety really sets in, which may have taken me to the doctor a couple of weeks ago, about a month ago. Finally, I just went and, and um, as, as I know Marcus said in the chat, you know, I, I was real transparent with my students. This has been a tough season for me. 
And I realized that a lot of my anxiety came when, when it was a lot about, but I, but I, but I, more on that um, in, in just a minute. This is where a lot of our students are. They're like, how am I going to, how can I, and why don't I, why don't, and so uh, the, the, those two great questions, what is your greatest source of pain? Why are you crying? And then who is it you're looking for? Or how are you trying to medicate that pain? And then how do we get students to this moment of I have seen the Lord? trying to get them from the question mark to the exclamation point. So I, I, I coined this term years ago that I call sycamore creativity. I like Jeff's new word, cre creative. I don't remember how he said it, Jeff, but um, I like this idea of sycamore creativity. I don't have time to talk a lot about this, but those of you that know me, you, you, you have to have heard me talk about the sycamore tree because years and years ago, um, this became the guiding metaphor for my ministry. I, I really, my first three or four years, I wanted to be a savior. Not that I wanted to be Jesus, not that I thought I was Jesus, but I wanted to be the person that fixed the kid's problems. And if a kid messed up and suddenly I felt like it was my fault or I had done something wrong, if there was a problem with the family, I wasn't there to help. If some kid wasn't paying attention, I wasn't a good enough teacher. Again, the anxiety comes because it was all about me. And um, I've got to tell this really quickly, but I was teaching at a camp so long ago, and I asked the question, what would have happened if Zacchaeus had not crawled up in that tree? Well, the answer I was looking for was more theological than I could have expected from eight to 13-year-olds. I was looking for, um, well, salvation would not have come to his house. But a little eight-year-old girl raised her hand, and she really changed the course of my ministry. I said, yes, yes, what would have happened if Zacchaeus had not, not crawled up in that tree? And she said, well, his song would not have been nearly as much fun to sing. And everybody laughed. And I was confused because I didn't quite get, get it at first. And she looked down because everybody was laughing at her. And I said, what? And she said, uh, much less, uh, or more tentatively, she said, uh, uh, his, well, I said his song would not be as much fun to sing. And I said, I don't, what are, you, what are you talking about? And then it hit me. And I realized, oh, yeah, 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 that's it. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. And a wee little man was he. He started to come from a sycamore tree, but he didn't. And it's a terrible song. It really is a terrible song. And I just stood there for a moment because I'd been in ministry for about five years at this time. And I thought, that's it. I'm not a savior. I'm a sycamore. And when I'm a sycamore, I, I exist. David Skidmore exists to be a sycamore tree to students, rising them above the distractions of the crowd that they might see the approaching savior, not in my programs, not what I'm doing. Everything that I do is a sycamore tree to lift them above the distractions of the crowd that they might see the approaching savior who cares about them a whole lot more than I do. Dudley already talked about the three questions of adolescence, which most of us on this call are very familiar with. Who am I? Where do I fit? And why do I matter? Well, again, there's the I, 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 but they're so self-focused and trying to answer these particular questions. I want to recommend one resource. This might be one of my four practical things here. I hope this is all tracking so far. It's a book by Ken DeCreasy, Dean, and Ron Foster called The God-Bearing Life. It's an old book. And it is probably the most helpful, one of the top five most helpful books in my ministry. I think it looks maybe like this now. They may have changed the cover again, but I would just challenge everybody to get a copy of this book and work through it. Um, I don't have time to say a lot about it, but one of the things that they quote a, a 91 report of the Carnegie Council on Adolescent Development, where they say significant Adult youth relationships forged in religious youth work had more positive impact on youth development than any other youth ministry system available. She says, uh, Dean says, the places most likely to fuel our faith are close to home and are found not in those mountaintop experiences that we get so, you know, keyed up about in youth ministry, but in the familiar terrain of significant relationships with Christian adults who bring us face to face with the God who wants to transform us and not to destroy us. Well, now we're familiar with the LifeWay study done years ago and, and lots of other studies that, that say 80, the number that goes from 75 to 85 or 90 in some cases, 80% are going to leave after graduation. So, we have to ask ourselves, why do two of them stay? It's a pretty good question. And LifeWay found this. The, the, the top three reasons in order. Three, they attended a church where the Bible was taught in a relevant way. Okay, that makes sense to all of us. Number two, they had three or four adults walking in their life other than a parent. And they said that one was really, really key. More on that in a minute. And then number one, they had a mom and a dad or a mom or a dad. And they're very quick to say it doesn't have to be both. Um, who was passionate about their own relationship with Jesus. This is very, very important. So we know that discipleship goes in the home, but I want to come back to that second one. 94% of those who identified as mature Christian adults reported that they had parents who made sure they were surrounded by and connected to three or four other adults. Now, again, I'm not, those of us on the call, especially if you've been in ministry for 
uh, for more than one year, you're like, yeah, we get this. We know this. Well, let's keep talking. Um, they call this long lines of convergent faithfulness. Um, I, I like the, that's a very academic kind of term. Um, but I, I like what um, Kara Powell says. She says youth ministry programs are thinly veiled excuses for teens to hang out with other adults. I just love that quote. Every program, whether it's a bowling night at the bowling alley or a service project, whatever we're doing, they should be viewed as thinly veiled excuses for teens to hang out with other adults. So we talk with our students about our three. Now this is um, a common idea. I'm gonna go through it really quickly. This is a practical idea. You may do it as a retreat. You could do it as a small group study. You could do it as a class, but we walk our students through our three. Now you all have heard this before, right? We all need a Paul, a Barnabas and a Timothy not just trying to use male names, but it's important that we have these three names um, uh, from scripture. And you know, whether you're a guy or a girl, you need these three people in your life. You need somebody who is gonna go ahead of you. And then you're gonna need somebody who walks with you. And then you're gonna need somebody who follows after you. Well, most of us are, are Pauls for a lot of students. So we've got a lot of Timothys. And on this call, we're here together because we have a lot of Barnabas in our lives. Um, and most of us need to have a Paul. Maybe we lack in that area. Most of our students, they've got a Paul. They've got a lot of Barnabas. We don't do very well at teaching them how to have Timothys. That's something that we've got to work on. And I'll talk about that in just a second. This is my favorite picture that our youth group takes every year. It's of our senior Sunday where we have um, our graduates. They pick an 80-day mentor. And they choose this person, same uh, person of their gender, somebody preferably that goes to our church but doesn't have to be. And they, they asked them to follow them through the first 80 days of their college life. This is their Paul. And they say, uh, we ask four commitments. We want you to pray for them by name every day during the first 80 days. We want you to contact them once a week somehow in the first 80 days. We want you to follow up with them until they have found a community of faith in Jesus to be a part of. And then finally, we want you to follow up with them when they come back at the end of the semester. And just we just ask them to do those four things. Because again, uh, 2 Timothy 2, 2 is really our theme verse in our youth group. What you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who will in turn be qualified to teach others. Discipleship happens, you know, when it's happened in more than one generation. So we call that our 80-day mentor program. I went through that really quickly. I've got a document that they signed that goes through those that I could probably email or make available for. I didn't send it yet, but I could maybe send it to, to be put online. But um uh, you can go back and listen to the recording and get those four commitments, add some of your own. But we have found this to be one of the most, most successful things that we have done because most of the people you see in this picture are still connected to those adults. Um, my, my daughter who graduated this particular year, which was two years ago, she still meets regularly with her 80 day mentor. I've got a group of guys that I meet with at Bojangles every Tuesday night. Now they didn't pose for this picture. I took it while they were praying without me knowing it, but we meet every Tuesday night and we just go through a, a passage of scripture together. I am their Paul, uh, they are each other's Barnabas, and then most three of the guys in this picture have now started a discipleship group with seventh grade guys where they are, are they, they've got their own Timothys. I could talk for 30 minutes just about this, and I'm not going to, but most of us have something that we're doing, you know, like this, um, but this is, this is what I mean that this is uh, vitally important as we, as we move forward. Now, I want to pause for a second on this picture, and I'd love, I don't, uh, Dr. Horton may be still on the call, and I'd love to find out if she knows the origin of this picture. It's been used in counseling circles for years. I don't know the name of it or where it first came, and I don't have a document that really legitimately walks you through how to use it, but I've, it's been a part of my ministry since 1996. If you want to get a screenshot of this, I'm going to give everybody a chance to do that now. I tried to find my JPEG of it to, to put in, and I can probably get that to Joella so that she can make it available. Hey, David, um, lower, yeah. lower, lower some anxiety by saying that you, can, you will share this uh, PowerPoint with all of us. Okay, yes, I will. Um, so here is a, a picture that you can use with your students, and I use it in counseling with individuals, with small groups, with my D group on uh, Bojangles on Tuesday nights, with couples in premarital counseling. And we, we do it routinely. So we often, our group goes through it about once a year. You just show this picture and you simply ask, tell me spiritually where you are in this picture and why. And everybody picks a person. It doesn't matter the gender of the kid in the picture. And somebody may pick the same character. Multiple people may pick the same person for very different reasons. And you just say, tell us who you are. This has provided more conversation over the years. I know lots of groups that have taken this 
um, and have used it with their groups and their small groups. And then you can pull it back out a year later and say, okay, last year you were this kid, who are you now? Sometimes I'll ask students, who were you last year? Who are you now? And who do you, who's the next person that you want to be? Where are you trying to get to? Lots of ways to use this. I offer it very quickly as a practical tool. I just call it the sycamore tree. Um, but I'd love to find out exactly where it originated uh, because I, I don't know where it originated. So I'd love if somebody knows that. It'd be great to find out. Um, so I know I'm moving very quickly, but uh, I will share this and you can, can catch up with it later. But I want to keep going. Another practical tool that we did in 2016 was something that we just called hashtag 52K16. Again, uh, you'll, I'll share this, but if you want to get a screenshot, you can. Some of you I've shared this with, and it's probably been one of the most helpful tools that our group has used. 52 weeks, 52 chapters that we think every student should know. Um, one of these days, my plan is to turn this into a book of some sort. I, I, I've got a lot of, of ideas and no time to do them, but, but I believe this is one of the more important things that our group has done. I, I polled about 30 different people. Um, uh, that have been uh, followers of Jesus for a long time and said, give me your 10 most significant chapters. And so from that, I built a family feud kind of top 52 answers. Um, and survey says, here they are. Now, are there more important chapters on the list that should be on the list? Sure. Is yours on this list? Maybe or maybe not. But you'll recognize some of the heavy hitters. And these were the things that we thought were extremely important. And so here's what we uh, asked them to do. I'll, I'll leave that up there for just a second more if somebody wants to get a screen grab of that or wants to take a picture. Uh, there was some significance to the order in which we did them, but not totally. So, you know, feel free to add them. You don't have to do it the way we're doing it. But let's imagine that week number one is Ephesians chapter four. Here's what we asked our students to do. Because we knew when we asked them to read through the whole Bible in a year, maybe three kids are going to do that. Or if we said, let's read through the whole New Testament this semester, some kids are going to be faithful. We just needed something that kids could could take and chew and, and do with their Paul, Barnabas, and Timothy. So on Sunday, we just ask everybody to read the text. So read Ephesians chapter four. On Monday, go through and highlight the text. On Tuesday, take the same chapter and just pray through it. Now just insert your own name in the text and pray through it. On Wednesday, share the text with somebody else on social media or find some art, some way to do something to put it out there for the world that you're living with this text. On Thursday, read the text with a friend over the phone in the parking lot at school, at lunch or whatever. On Friday, write about the text, journal about it. And then on Saturday, read the text again and get ready for the new text on Sunday. It was so simple. And what happened is we had kids posting pictures of the, the passages they were highlighting. One girl did art for every single chapter and put together a, a whole exhibit of 52 pieces of art. Every kid's Instagram feed and Twitter feed, Snapchat was being blown up with some of these verses that caused a, spurred a lot of conversations. A lot of Bible journaling was going on with art. Our students began our Wednesday night uh, by reading the text with somebody else and sitting down and reading that chapter so that we knew that at least they were going to read it once if they came to church on a Wednesday night. And then on Thursdays, there were kids that got together and would, would share the text together with a friend um, and would read it together with a friend. One of our students uh, took it upon himself to write out every single chapter in a journal. And he said, I'm going to do this every single chapter. And he did by the end of the year. I'll tell you right now, I gave him a four-week head notice before Psalm 119 showed up on a Sunday. Because, yes, yeah, Psalm 119 was one of the chapters, and he wrote it out completely uh, by hand and had all of those journals there and wrote them all out. And it was uh, phenomenal. So I'm getting close to wrapping up here. I know uh, we got to go quick. Here's where our students are. And there's that word in the middle that's I, but I also want to remind you of what other word we see in the word anxious. We see this word us. And this is really the way that we counter this. I want to take just a moment uh, to recommend this book. I don't know um, if I can still be seen on the screen or not. Maybe I can stop sharing for just a moment. Um, but I, I do want to come back to this. This book by uh, Tim Elmore, The Pandemic Population, it just came out. It's a pretty fascinating book that was written pretty quickly. Um, but I just want to mention one thing that you're going to find in this book, and I don't really have time to go into it, but it addresses some of the things that Dr. Horton talked about and that Dudley talked about. A fascinating thing that he did, two, two things in this book that I thought were really, really cool. One, he interviewed a bunch of uh, kids that grew up in the Depression, and he found six, uh, uh, three negative trends and six positive trends from kids that grew up in the Depression. Then he interviewed qualitatively, like Dudley did for his research. They then interviewed um, 
students that are growing up in, in, in this you know, t time of quarantine. And even though it's been still pretty recent, they looked at those students. What they found was an almost an exact overlay between the three negative things that they saw in the students of the depression, kids of the depression. Um, the, the exact same three things emerged. Um, he said you could almost like a transparency uh, lay them, uh, uh, put them um, on top of one another. But he said the six positive things that came out of the kids in the depression, they were seeing none of them, none of them. And he said that was so strange. Now, I don't have time to get into it completely, but, um, and I, I have no, uh, uh, I, I get no commission off the sales of this book. But he said that the builder generation came out of the depression more humble, more grateful. They had a deeper work ethic. They were kinder, more resilient, and they were more resourceful. And he goes in the depth on those six things. He says, we're not seeing those in the kids that are growing up today. And he says, it's because we're seeing that the narrative of the builder generation was guided by the poets of their day, the, the, the entertainers, music, the, the works of art that they were looking at. And he said, what they're thinking that they're seeing is that the, the narrative being driven by the poets of our day are not leading our kids to these six places of, of greater resiliency and greater health. Now he explains it a lot more in the book. I just found it fascinating, especially a much deeper study that was done by a guy he mentions his name is Alberto Acerbi, an anthropologist, wrote a book in 2019 where he examined the song lyrics from 150,000 songs that all hit the Billboard Top 100 chart from 1965 to 2015. And then he goes through and compares, and again, I don't have time to go into it, but I found the results of, of that single issue or that single uh, research alone fascinating when he said we looked at these 110,000 songs and he said we began to realize our kids today are getting a very different narrative of how to deal with anxiety than those who grew up in 1929 and 1930. It was really, really a fascinating study. Um, I want to share the screen again. I'm about to wrap up and we may have some time for some, uh, some other questions. Um, give me one second to uh, finish this up. So here is us, those of us on this call. We now are faithful stewards. I've been in ministry now for 25 years. I don't know that I'm any more qualified to say any of the things that I said than anybody else on this call if you work with students. Everybody here, whether you've done it for one year or, or 35 years, we're all sycamore trees. We are a grove of sycamore trees, and we're just trying to lift kids above the distractions of the crowd. Dudley talked about the distractions of the crowd. Uh, Dr. Horton talked about the distractions of the crowd. Um, and so what do, uh, what do we do? Well, I wanna give you one last image and then Jeff, I'll be done. I came across this in the news, it was actually last year when there were some wildfires, much like the ones right now that uh, we read so much about in, in uh, California and places like Australia that just dealt with some recently. But this was in Chile in South America. 2017, 100 different fires destroyed 1.5 million acres, costing only 11 lives, but $333 million in damages. And it was, uh, land was destroyed. Here's a drone picture of what that looked like after these fires. Now imagine 100 different forests that look just like this destroyed. I, I'm looking at these images and I'm thinking, yeah, if you zoom up and get above our high schools, this picture looks like most of the high schools in America. Scorched earth with a few trees trying to hang on and kids saying, I don't know how I'm going to make it. I don't know how I'm going to survive. I don't know how I can live with this. And those of us that are trying to deal with that anxiety, it creates anxiety in us thinking, how are we going to possibly minister to this? And that's where my anxiety, I think, came from that took me to the doctor a month ago because I, I didn't really recognize it. But this has been heavy for all of us. Whether you've been in ministry for two months or for 20 years, this has been a very difficult season. And so in the news, I found out about a mom named Das and her daughters, Olivia and Summer. And this this them right there. Here's a picture of them. This is Olivia, Das and her daughters, Olivia and Summer. Their uh, owners, or their humans, however you want to refer to it, um, they had an idea. They said, we know what we can do. What if we took these dogs, these are border collies, by the way, that are known for their speed, their intelligence, and their endurance. And so what they did is they fixed them up. This was their idea. They fixed them up with a little backpack, like you see here. 
they put little seeds uh, on them, and then they sent them out to run through these forests. So these animals can cover 18 miles a day. They can distribute 20 pounds of seed every single day, and they just filled up their bags with seed, and then they sent them off, and they ran through these forests, dropping the seed everywhere they went. You can see in these pictures the seed beginning to fall. And you're like, yeah, it's 100 acres. I mean, I'm sorry, 1.5 million acres, 100 different forests. These dogs didn't really know or care. They just know they were given a job. They were faithful to it. Their speed, their endurance, and their intelligence have resulted in pictures like this. 15 different forests have now returned because these dogs went and scattered this seed. And when I saw this story on the news, I thought, this, this is it. This is, the, this is the image of what we're supposed to do. I've got, you know, six guys that I meet with at Bojangles. I shared this story with them, and I said, guys, I feel so overwhelmed about the amount of scorched earth that has resulted not just from COVID, but from all of the racial tension and from all of the political polarization. I'm really struggling, but you know what? Every week I'm going to meet here and I'm going to equip you guys with as much seed as I can because you guys are younger, you've got more endurance, uh, in some cases more intelligence, and I'm going to send you out that you might go and run and that you might scatter that seed so that we can grow more sycamore trees and we can get more forest so that more people might rise above the distractions of the crowd that the others, their friends, might see the approaching Savior more clearly. Um, that really is, uh, is all I know to say in the midst of this. We're all struggling. Um, this is, there have been some heavy topics talked about today, and, and it weighs on me. Even hearing the things they talked about, I had to kind of check myself because I was already feeling some of those same tensions in my chest that took me to the doctor about a month ago. And it's all okay. Um, we're going to have the peace that passes understanding. In this world, we will have trouble, but Jesus says, take heart. I have overcome the world. I've had Amen. to rest on those promises every single day. Amen. Um, I don't know if any of that has been helpful. Jeff, you just kind of asked me to try to give a, a passion for ministry, some practical tools, and to kind of end today's discussion on an inspiring note. And I don't know if I've done any of that but I've tried to be faithful to that. It's been an honor to be with you. It's more of an honor to serve alongside you. I don't care how many students are in any of our groups. I don't care how, how, how large your churches are. I don't care how long you've been in ministry. All of us are equipped with sacks of seed. And my challenge to you today is that you run, 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 and let's return the forest to their glory. May God be praised. Jeff, I'll turn it back to you. David Skidmore, I am so thankful that uh, Michael Jordan and LeBron James chose to play basketball. I'm thankful that Tony Fauci went into medicine, but most of all, I am thankful that you chose ministry. Thank you. What a fire hose of good stuff.